Well, as per the introduction, I'm going to talk about close friendship uh, and how we think about our friendships. Uh, we each have very different ideas about what it means to be a close friend. Some of these differences are simply a matter of personal preference. But how we think about close friendship is also very strongly related to the culture in which we grew up. And that's the topic of my talk today. I would like to tell you a little bit about my research in cultural differences in close friendship. My hope is that you'll come away thinking about your own friendships in new and creative ways. I would like to begin by asking you to consider the following scenario. Suppose that you were riding in a car, your best friend is driving the car, the best friend is speeding, and unfortunately hits a pedestrian. Okay. And a little later, it turns out that you are the only witness to this event, and you've been asked to testify. If you testify that your friend was indeed speeding, he or she will most certainly go to jail. However, if you testify that your friend was not speeding, he or she will most certainly go free. What would you do? Cross-cultural researchers have posed this scenario to thousands of people in many different cultures of the world. I'm going to tell you about just two of the results beginning with South Korea, since I lived there also for a year, and their ideas about friendship have strongly influenced my thinking. In South Korea, 63% of the respondents said that they would testify in favor of the friend. In other words, they would testify that the friend was not speeding. To them, the issue is friendship. Friends take care of each other. After all, if you can't count on your friends to look out for you, who can you count on? In the US, only 7% would testify in favor of the friend. In other words, 93% would essentially rat on their friend. Okay? <laughs> to them, to them it's, it's not a question of friendship so much of, uh, I mean, they feel really bad about telling on their friend, but, but to them, it's a matter of justice and fairness. And the just and fair thing to do in this case is to tell the truth. Even if their very good friend, their close friend, has to pay the consequences. I originally became interested in this line of research, as Mike said, because I spent a year in Paris teaching at the American University, and I was really uh, uh, bowled over by how different my friendships were experienced in France compared to at home. And I've been making this the focus of my research ever since. Okay? One of the first things I learned when I got home and began to read in this area was that we in the US Believe it or not, we have a very bad reputation internationally when it comes to the issue of close friendship. It all began with the writings of Alex de Tocqueville back in 1831 in his grand treatise, Democracy in America. He saw Americans as very hardworking, very striving, trying to achieve the good life. But a side effect of all this work orientation was that our friendships tended to be very superficial, very shallow. He said it was hard for them to have strong ties between each other. Okay. Uh, he also argued that we're very open and friendly, but that close, committed friendships are not the norm. De Tocqueville's words left me wondering, was the difference between my friendships in France and my friendships at home, was it merely a matter of depth? Are we just more shallow and, and too preoccupied with ourselves to engage in meaningful friendships. I had a hard time with that idea, simply because I felt much closer to my American friends than my French friends, whom I'd only known for a short period of time. I think, instead, what we are is we're just very different in terms of how we think about close friendship. However, de Tocqueville's words kept haunting me. I read various authors from various backgrounds, different expertise, and they were all saying pretty much the same thing that we in the US, that uh, we're very open and friendly, but that uh, uh, close, committed friendships are not the norm. Okay. Uh, I began my research in, in earnest by interviewing international students on Winthrop University campus where I was teaching at the time. And uh, I got volunteers each year to, who were willing in confidential surveys and interviews to tell me about their friendship experiences while they were at Winthrop. Okay. Um, and I found a very clear and consistent pattern in their friendship story. When they first arrived at Winthrop, they were so excited. 
uh, they found Americans so approachable, so easy to make friends with. But then after the first few weeks, I mostly heard about their frustration. Uh, I also interviewed them in their final weeks on campus, just before they were ready to leave to go home for the last time. I would ask them about their life at Winthrop, whether they had made friends, and whether they planned on staying in contact with anybody after they returned home. A surprising number of them would say they hadn't made a single American friend, that the friends they were closest to, the people they planned on staying in contact with, were other international students. A few of them would say, quite bluntly, Americans don't know how to be friends. Again, I had a hard time with that assessment. Um, I think we do value friendship. I think friends play a very important role in our lives. After all, there's a fairly extensive research uh, literature on the benefits, especially the health benefits of close friendship in the US. These studies wouldn't make any sense at all if our friendships were meaningless and superficial. Again, I tend to think that we're just different in how we think about close friendship. Uh, let me tell you about one of my own studies that brings this point home more directly. In this study, I asked students in France, Spain, the US, Cuba, and China to read the following vignette. They read this vignette in their own languages and with names that would be appropriate to their own cultures. Megan and Cheryl attend the same university, and they are the best of friends. While they often have fun together and care a lot about each other, schoolwork is one area where they differ. Megan is less interested in school and is only an average student, while Cheryl does well in nearly every course she takes. Cheryl tries to influence Megan to be a better student so that she will be successful in life. Sometimes Cheryl reads over Megan's class notes, making corrections and adding specific information for her to study. Cheryl often insists that Megan study when she doesn't really feel like it. Cheryl thinks that Megan is too interested in having fun and not sufficiently serious about her work. They are the best of friends, but they clearly have different ideas about school. I, I learned that the, uh, what I got out of this study was that the students in France, I'm sorry, the students in the US and France tended to see that friendship as an unhealthy one. They tended to see uh, Cheryl as being too pushy, trying to control Megan's life trying to run her affairs. They argued that if they're really to be close friends, they need to learn to accept each other as they are and not try to change one another. On the other hand, students in China, Cuba, and Spain tended to see it as a very close, a very committed friendship. Cheryl really cared for Megan and was trying to help her out. Especially the students in Cuba, they saw it as typical behavior between two close friends. Okay. The way I interpret these results is that the students in China, Cuba, and Spain are more comfortable with a style of friendship I refer to as the interveners. Interveners feel like it is their duty, their, their responsibility to take care of their friends, to look out for them, to help them out, to guide them, to give them instructions, to, to protect them. I found this version of friendship to be especially common in South Korea. I don't want to overstate these stereotypes, folks. I mean, uh, in my model, I have six different styles of friendship altogether, and I can find all six of them in any culture of the world. But I did seem to find more of them in South Korea. So what is the opposite of being an intervener? The opposite of an intervener are the independents, and, the, and that version of friendship is more common in the US. And as the word implies, independents tend to uh, respect each other's autonomy, each other's freedom. They wouldn't think of intervening in each other's lives unless they were absolutely certain that these interventions would be appreciated. Uh, so what does it mean to have an independent friend? If they don't take care of each other, which generally speaking they don't, how do you know if you have an independent friend? And I would argue that an important part of their friendship is simply going out and having fun together, engaging in mutually enjoyable activities, going bowling, what have you. They enjoy this time together. It would be easy to underestimate the importance of having fun in a friendship. We in the US, especially when compared to Western European countries, we tend to uh, work very hard. We work many more hours a week. We have fewer vacation days than most countries. Our work is highly competitive. And uh, our work is very insecure. And the supports for those who lose their jobs are minimal. 
in a word, our work lives are very stressful. And as a result, you know, spending time with friends, getting away from the grind, so to speak, uh, allows us to feel like we have good friends, someone to share life's ups and downs with, uh, someone that you really can count on. Uh, but it doesn't stop with just having fun. Independent friends also help each other out in other ways. I've interviewed literally hundreds of people in the US, and I've surveyed thousands of them. And in the vast majority of cases, people will say in the US, they'll say, I've had friends who've really helped me through some tough times. And when they make those statements, I always think that's, that statement stands in such stark contrast to our reputation internationally as not appreciating close friendship. So I ask them in interviews, I say, explain to me, what do you mean your friends stood by you through difficult times? And typically what they'll do is they'll tell me about some episode in their life, some event, some problem at work or in their romantic lives or at school, or maybe a health crisis. And my friends stood by me through the entire ordeal. And again, I'll persist. I'll say, well, what exactly did they do to stand by you through the entire ordeal? And then they'll say things like, well, they came to visit me while I was in the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead on that one. They came to visit me while I was in the hospital. Or they, uh, they, um, uh, we, we, we spent hours and hours on the phone during this whole period, uh, and I couldn't have gotten through it without them. Or they took me out and got me totally smashed and put up with me crying in my beer all night long. OK. So I've told you about interveners and independents. I think it's important to remember how different these, their ideas are about what it means to be a close friend. And this is true of all the six styles of friendship that I talk about. It would be really hard for an intervener to have a friendship with an independent. They have very different notions about what it means to be a friend. The intervener is going to see the independent as cold, uh, somewhat distant, uncaring, uh, maybe even incapable of close friendship. At the same time, the independent is going to see the intervener as being too pushy, uh, trying to run my life, not respecting me, not accepting me the way I am. Uh, so you can see it would be very difficult for them to have a fulfilling and satisfying, mutually satisfying friendship. Well, I've told you a little bit about my research today. I hope you appreciate how different we are in terms of how we think about the issue of close friendship. And I hope that my friendship stories have helped you think about your own friendships in new and creative ways. Thank you. Thank you so much.